the state of artificial intelligence and fundraising. Hi, I'm Bill Stanjakovic. This is the first day from the Fundraising School, and I'm joined today by Ashutosh Nandeshwar. Ashutosh is Senior Vice President at CCS Fundraising, and his book is Data Sciences for Fundraising. And Ashutosh, what a delight to have you with us on the Fundraising School's podcast. Bill, thanks so much for having me. Ashutosh's background is as a data scientist, and he has brought that expertise into the philanthropic sector, helping nonprofits use data and technology and artificial intelligence to strengthen their fundraising abilities. And Ashutosh, I guess I would just ask you, kind of taking a step back, looking at the landscape, where are we right now with AI and fundraising? What's kind of the state of the field? Are you seeing it being used a lot? Are you seeing nonprofits still hesitant? What are your observations as you see the philanthropic sector utilizing AI for fundraising? First, I would like to break the AI into two groups. One is traditional AI, which encompasses of machine learning, predictive analytics, applied stats, applied math. And then second is the modern AI, which is generative AI, where people have really become familiarized with chat GPT, Claude, Gemini, and Copilot, and uh, so on and so forth. There is a clear line of demarcation between those two, and the use cases sometimes overlap, but it is important to understand the differences. So when you uh, ask a question like that, where, where are we in terms of uses, pre- the traditional AI with machine learning, predictive analytics has been uh, used in our industry for sure for the past 15, 20 years, but in the for-profit industry, maybe even more, 40, 50 mm-hmm. years with direct marketing, when, when we get all those coupons in the mail or when we get some discounts, that's all based on predictive AI. And then applications of those in the uh, in fundraising, as we wrote in our book also, is around prospect identification, prospect cultivation, prospect even qualification. What, what, what gift amount should we be asking for? Who should we be asking for? What is the right time? All those questions can be answered using predictive AI, where you look, at, look back at people's history of their uh, donations and giving, as well as attributes. How are they connected to different nonprofits? So when you look at all of that, you get really good estimates, mathematical formulas, how likely this person is to give, how much would they give, where would they give? But when you think about modern AI with generative AI, it has really democratized how these technologies can be used. Before, you needed needed to be a programmer. Again, as we speak about in the book, where we use the programming language called R, where you could do some of these things. You don't need to be a programmer. You can just open some of these chatbots, ask questions, create content, even uh, summarize news articles or extract entities from a news article. So if you wanted to see uh, who are the people mentioned or which organizations are mentioned in this article, in this news article, you don't have to write a script. You can just uh, paste that news article into ChatGPT. And you can get a list of table with or a table with a list of names and organizations within a couple of seconds. So when you think about that use case, we are seeing more and more nonprofits really curious, wanting to experiment with their content generation or as well as trying to summarize documents or extract meaning or themes or topics. So we are seeing more adoption in generative AI because of the simplicity and how easy really it is to use. But then predictive AI, as we discussed, has been used for 15, 20 years at least. I greatly appreciate that entire answer, including the point that you raised about the opportunity to democratize the use of artificial intelligence with fundraising. It seems that right now there might be sort of a paradox that the medium and smaller nonprofits can benefit most from generative AI in the context of they don't have a lot of people and AI can be very valuable. But perhaps only the largest nonprofits that have the capacity are kind of the earliest adopters of AI. So are you seeing that? Are we seeing more widespread use of AI or are we still kind of with the larger nonprofits and AI is still finding its way the generative AI is still finding its way more slowly towards the medium and small nonprofits. What are you seeing in the field? I would say it's both. Uh, If you look at some of these surveys from McKinsey or BCG, you do see knowledge workers, uh, 70 to 80 percent of them, respondents, say that they have used generative AI in some capacity. So if you take that slice and apply that to our industry also, 
and we have done some surveys also in our CCS fundraising survey, we do see a good adoption across different uh, sizes of the organizations. But I would say, as you were raising the democratization point also, smaller nonprofits definitely benefit from this because they are sometimes strapped for resources, strapped for time. And if they wanted to get quick social media posts or again, uh, thinking about cultivation strategies or trying to come up with some sort of case statements or uh, they could upload as long as they monitor the data privacy uh, terms of services and how the data would be used. And if it's not too proprietary or confidential, as long as it's open in the public and they upload some of these documents, so say annual report, they could get quick case statements based on their annual reports, or they could get a quick qualification email or some sort of information email that they could send out. So we are seeing lots of use from smaller nonprofits also, but as you said, when it comes to scale and when it comes to implementation enterprise-wise, that's when organizations with more resources in IT, analytics, or technology systems kind of folks, because you do need a structure if you wanted to scale some of these activities. So we are seeing it on both spectrums, on both ends, but I would say smaller nonprofits are using this more and more. That is so gratifying to hear. And uh, as they do, and as you do your work and you observe the field, are you hearing any common concerns or any common worries or any common fears, either me using AI or what AI might do? I mean, again, is this uh, wonderful field has blossomed with everybody showing that movie clip where AI refuses to open the door, right? And everybody's worried, am I going to type something in and AI is just going to take over the world? Are, are, what kind of concerns or worries uh, might you be hearing uh, as you do this work? When ChatGPT came to the scene to 2022, September, there were lots of these types of concerns. Uh, even the Economist magazine in their front cover showed this kind of one side devil, one side kind of a benefactor. And at that time, people were scared. Some of the people actually even created this auto GPT just to create chaos, to see if these agents, if these AI systems could create chaos and uh, try to end the world by uh, uh, handicapping some of these systems or uh, disabling some of these systems. None of that happened. Uh, none of those concerns actually became uh, true because it's just the, the technology is just not there yet where it can take complete control and try to overwrite some of our decision-making power, which leads us to the second point is that human involvement is still so critical where some of these things, as some of the examples that we talked about, yes, it might create a good content copy, it might create a good marketing copy, but it's still not good enough because we are not able to put our personal touches. It doesn't necessarily reflect our organization's language or how we communicate about our donors, our needs, or priorities. So there's still, uh, uh, and sometimes it just makes stuff up. It will just be uh, confidently incorrect and it will keep saying that this is correct. So those are some of the things that we need to co correct and we need to be, uh, we need to insert ourselves into the process. So that's why those concerns are now are not there anymore where we know that we the human in the loop, as they say, is still required. But some of the other concerns that we touched upon earlier is data privacy. That's definitely the number one concern people have, especially if you're a um, hospital system or a medical system, you don't want to be putting any medically sensitive information into these systems. Sometimes uh, some other confidential, confidential information that you don't want to put in these systems because unless you review the terms of service, services, you will see that uh, they will use your data for further training. And now whatever you wrote about that donor prospect might be in their data systems, which they did not have access before. So you have to be very careful. And some organizations have taken an approach that you're not going to use any, you're not going to use any of these tools because we are afraid some of this data might get leaked through to these systems. Other organizations have said, well, here are our guardrails. Do not put this type of data, any personally identified information or any medically sensitive information. But outside of that, yeah, go ahead, try, experiment. And that's uh, CCSS approach has been also to try out because unless you try out uh, some of these things, you would not know their possibilities, as well as the limitations. And those both things are very critical, especially for leaders to really understand what the limitations are, but also understand what the opportunities are so that we can implement and use uh, to their fullest. I love how you said that not only can AI be uh, incorrect, it can be confidently incorrect. 
Um, when I teach on this, I tell the story. The first three times I asked AI for a, a bio of Dr. Bill Sanjakevich, uh, it listed three colleges and universities for each of my three degrees that I never attended. <laughs> and the second time, it was three other schools that I never attended. And the third time, it was three other schools that I've never attended. Uh, and so those nine schools, don't you be contacting me for alumni donations because I did not attend, regardless of what uh, AI is saying. So, yes, we do need to be careful. And, uh, you know, Ashutosh, I also appreciated what you had to say about it doesn't necessarily have our voice. I think, you know, we read these things where, like, people say, you know, write me a speech in the voice of, you know, Winston Churchill or John F. Kennedy. Well, those are people who are very famous with lots of speeches and AI can try to you know, kind of sh shape it in a way that, uh, you know, a famous person from history may have been known to speak, but not necessarily our nonprofits. And so we add our voice, we add our touch, we add our wisdom, we add that human touch. And let me ask you about this then, about what, maybe what AI cannot do, is if AI can help us with those first drafts that we have to make sure are correct and that we do need to add our voice and our wisdom and such, that AI at the very best then is buying us more time to spend more human time with our donors. Are you seeing that, that the if AI is hand, handling some of these mechanization type activities, that that's freeing up fundraisers for more time to do what they should be doing, and that's spending time face-to-face -face with donors? We have not seen any evidence of that it is shrinking that timeline uh, so much, the time required to do some of these activities that they are able to reallocate that time to do some of these face-to-face -face activities. But that's the promise. And that's the premise behind these technologies that once we start using this more often, some of the tasks that we don't like as much uh, could be automated, could be, uh, as you said, maybe not even a first draft, a zero draft, but you still it will still save you a lot of time rather than staring at a blank screen. You will have a good enough draft that you can iterate upon. You can add your thoughts. But I don't think we have seen any evidence where people are saying, well, this is so good that I can now get two hours of my time every day back and I can use those two hours to uh, do some of these activities that I enjoy, building relationships, cultivating prospects. So I, I don't think we are just there yet. And that is the promise. And that is the premise that as AI advances, we'll see more of that as more people become more familiar. So Ashutosh, I want to ask you, what advice do you have for fundraisers? And I would, I would ask you to think in the context of that person who's at ground zero. They really haven't done much yet, or at the very most, they went on one of the free versions of artificial intelligence and just started poking around a little bit. Um, and they don't want this world to pass them by. They want to take advantage of all these positives that you've talked about and hopefully down the line, fulfill that promise and that premise of having more time to spend with donors. What advice do you have for fundraisers to you know, who do want to embrace this in safe ways and ethical ways to become more skilled? I would say start. Start whatever you have, whatever is in front of you, even as you said, the free version or the trial version. I think the worst that could happen is because of the concerns or because of a lot of this hype that we might discount it completely. I think that would be a mistake to discount. I mean, I... Every day, as you were saying, you see all of these examples where some of the influencers might say, oh, look at this, all this great stuff you can do. You can create a web application within two minutes. And you know that some of that is hype because that code will be incorrect. And it is it will not be an enterprise application that you can just push out. I mean, a good example of that is the, the CrowdStrike example where a human developer pushed a, a new release to patch some sort of bug. But that push created this wholesale scale effect, bringing out all the systems across the world. Now imagine if an automated system, an AI agent, as they call it, were able to create some of these other additional mistakes, and now it's everywhere. That would be just really, really bad. And fortunately, the systems are not there yet. Fortunately, people are not putting those things into the system, like this agent agentic workflows, as they call it. So... We don't have anything to be afraid of just yet. So my advice would always be is try, experiment, because again, you would not know the limitations unless you try. As I mentioned, the code could be incorrect. The As you mentioned, your profile would be incorrect. But then you would at least know when not to use this. You should not use this to create a prospect briefing because it will just make stuff up. But what could you use it for? Well, if you wanted to just send uh, quick LinkedIn posts or social media posts, 
it's really good for that. If you wanted to create some imagery that is abstract, not real, because it will again make stuff up when it's trying to create real, uh, real types of images. But if it's an abstract image, then it's really good for that. But again, you would not know where to apply these things and you won't be able to necessarily direct if you have uh, team members where to direct their energies. If you take too much of hype, you will say, oh yeah, it should solve all the problems. Why are you not using this right now? Or if you take a, a completely agnostic approach or even um, not buying into this, then you will miss out on the potential that it has to offer. So my advice would be is to try it out, experiment, learn, and keep practicing, keep trying it every day. There are some new use cases every day keep popping up, and but then you adjust it, uh, your, your outlook based on the outcomes that you see. Both the you know, borders of the parameters are, are incorrect. This isn't something to be feared and shunned. This also is not a magic wand that will solve it, it, just everything. And Ashutosh is giving us good advice here, a measured, balanced approach, just like any of the other fundraising skills that you've learned, taking it one step at a time. And Ashutosh, before we conclude, I just want to make sure that I haven't limited your expertise here. Is there other advice or any other observations uh, that are in your head and on your heart as you do this work? and see the philanthropic sector doing the best it can to apply AI to fundraising. And again, the book is Data Sciences for Fundraising. Are there any other final points that you wanna offer as guidance for our audience here today? Yeah, a couple of things I will say in this hype of generative AI is some people are also not, or maybe they're overlooking the promise that traditional AI also has to offer. And the Data Sciences for Data Science for Fundraising book that talks about how you can apply traditional methods for identification, cultivation, 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 and qualification. And those methods, even if you look at in the for-profit industry, still drives 90% of our interactions on the web. And it is driving mm. lots of these transactions, lots driving lots of revenue for some of these big companies. So we should still continue to think about that, how we can employ those techniques, those methods to become more efficient into our day-to-day -day world. And second, tied to that, is when you think about traditional AI and when you think about the benefits of generative AI, you should think about automation also because that's when we can also start seeing lots of efficiencies. So for example, if you are a university and let's say you have uh, every year you get a file for uh, people who are graduating that year, you could create an automation where every time the file comes, something happens with that file rather than yeah. pulling those spreadsheets down, going name by name, trying to think, okay, what should we do with these names? there could be lots of automations that could be built to quickly filter through that information, append the records where needed, also do some sort of prospecting through that. So I would say think about traditional AI, definitely, because there's lots of benefits still to be derived from that. And second, think about how you can apply automation to bridge the gap between traditional AI and generative AI to become very efficient in your processes. Again, the book is Data Sciences for Fundraising. The author is Dr. Ashutosh Nundeshwar. He's a senior vice president at CCS. And Ashutosh, what a delight to have you with us on the Fundraising School this podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. This was terrific. And we have a course and a forthcoming certificate on this topic of AI or fundraising. We also have instruction on digital fundraising techniques, AI or otherwise, and of course, these co courses are offered online. See what we've done there? If you can't learn them online, probably can't use them online. So we'd love to have you there. In fact, we have a certificate in digital fundraising, which is one of our five certificates that we offer amongst 25 different public courses. We do have an in-person presence in 10 U.S. cities. And of course, we're online in the United States and anywhere across the world. We have custom training on these AI and digital fundraising topics. And from any of our curriculum, we can bring a the entire course just to you, or we can take parts of courses and knit them together for your specific needs. We have quarterly webinars and, of course, these weekly podcasts. All of our knowledge is gathered in our textbook, Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, the book now out in its fifth edition. Where do you find us? Online at go.iu.edu forward slash TFRS for the Fundraising School. Grateful for our producers today, Mike Anthony, the Emmy Award winner, alongside Jennifer Boffman, CFRM. I'm Bill Sanjakevich, and now you are now more fully informed on this first day from the Fundraising School. Mm -hmm.